it's widely accepted that the book of Job is probably the oldest book of the Bible, that it was written before any, or not that it was written before any other book was written, but the story of Job takes place before all of the other books of the Bible were written. Even people who don't believe in God or like the Bible admit that there is no piece of literature that handles the problem of pain with more honesty and more realism than Job. It is, even amongst people who don't know God or don't like the Bible, it is a literary and theological masterpiece. It's a book about suffering and sovereignty. It's a book about providence and pain. It's about those intersections in life where misery and mercy collide, where grief and grace crash into each other, where catastrophe and compassion wreck. It's about how our darkest fears and deepest frustrations can lead to freedom like you never thought possible. We're going to see that as we make our way through this book, that our Darkest fears and deepest frustrations can give birth to freedom like we never thought possible. It's about doubt and despair and our arrogant, natural propensity to make assumptions regarding who God is and what God does. What we see as we make our way through the book of Job is Job and his friends in different ways stand in judgment over God, evaluating God, critiquing God. It's about being a broken person living in a broken world with other broken people, but with a faithful God. That's what the book of Job is about. It's about the fact that life is hard and pain is real, but grace abounds. I said a minute ago that I'm fully aware that preaching through Job is dangerous. So brace yourself. I know that Um, In fact, I have no doubt that, as I mentioned, God has us going through this book to prepare some of us for pain like we've never experienced. We don't know it's coming, but it's on the horizon. And my prayer is that our time together will prepare us for that day. Prepare us even better to live life as a broken person in a broken world with other broken people. Now, I want to offer some definitions at the front end. This, is, this sermon's kind of introductory in nature. We're doing sort of a, a broad overview of the themes of this book. Um, and I want to begin by making a couple of uh, comments regarding suffering, offering some definitions. Because when most of us think about suffering, we think of the deadly Ds, death, disease, divorce, depression, you know, the big stuff, crisis, And so, because we may not be going through any of that right now, we may think, well, we're not in a season of suffering. Suffering hasn't come to our door recently that we're sort of in the clear as of late. But suffering is much bigger and broader than the deadly Ds. It's so much bigger and broader than crises, the big stuff. Everyday stuff like frustration and disappointment and anxiety and fear and insecurity and stress and my ongoing struggle with me, with others, with God, with with my circumstances, all of that is suffering too. Dealing with the aches and pains that we have in our body from time to time, all of that is suffering too. Relational strain, loneliness, this nagging sense of not enoughness, the feeling of being misunderstood, the feeling of being rejected, even in the smallest ways, it's all suffering. And when we understand suffering like that, then we have to admit that there has never been a day since we came into this world that has been suffering free that we have suffered from the moment we came into this world and we will suffer until the moment we leave it. We all suffer. Pain is unavoidable. As R.E.M. said, everybody hurts. It's true. It's a universal reality. And the way we often handle our suffering makes it worse. I had a friend once say to me that we never just suffer the thing we're suffering. We also suffer the way that we're suffering the thing we're suffering. Okay, I'll say that again. I had to ask him to say it again to me, so I'm going to say it again to you. We never just suffer the thing we're suffering. 
So for instance, your child goes off the deep end or your marriage is falling apart. You're not just suffering that, you are suffering that, but we also suffer the way that we're suffering the thing we're suffering. In other words, we have a tendency to trouble our own troubles. By the way we handle our suffering, we induce more suffering. By the way we handle our troubles, we, we induce more trouble. And one of the ways we do this is when we have unrealistic expectations of life in this fallen world. We all do, as I'm going to prove in a minute, we all do have some unrealistic expectations of what life in this fallen world is supposed to feel like, is supposed to be. Let me say this. Bad theology leads to false expectations. And what I mean by that is that if you're going to be prepared for the suffering that you face daily, you better have a robust theology of the fall. What do I mean? Well, we have to go all the way back to Genesis to know what I mean by that. Because in Genesis 1 through 3, the Bible tells us that God made everything good. And that we then broke every good thing God made. And as a result, this world and everyone in it is twisted out of shape. None of us and none of the things in this world are the way God originally intended them to be. We're all twisted out of shape. We're all out of sorts. We're all broken, fallen. I've used this definition before, borrowing from Cornelius Plantinga, who defines sin as the vandalism of shalom. It's my favorite definition of sin that's ever been presented. Shalom is that Hebrew word that means wholeness, integration, things being complete, things operating harmoniously the way they were intended to. And Cornelius planning a defined sin as the vandalism of shalom, the, the shattering of that. What he meant was that sin corrupts things, it, it breaks things, it separates things, it toxifies things, it unravels the fabric of our lives and the lives of others. That's the state of our world. And everything in it, it is a broken world. It's a fallen world. I love the way the Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 8. Love it. He says that the whole world is groaning, waiting for redemption. It's not only us who are waiting for redemption, waiting for that day when everything sad will become untrue when every tear will be wiped away, when everything wrong will be made right, a time when we will be able to enjoy what is most enjoyable with passion forever. That day's coming, but it's not now. And until that day comes, Paul says, it's not only us that are groaning, but it's the world. It's this broken world that is groaning for renewal. I love how he puts that. He, we live in this groaning world. You groan when you're in pain. You groan when you're in distress. You groan when you need help. You groan when you long for something better. And his point is, the world that we live in groans. We, we live in a world, listen to me, we live in a world where we can expect hardship, where we can expect difficulty where we can expect pain and sorrow because this world is broken. It's not functioning the way God intended for it to function. And if you don't embrace that theology, you leave yourself with the inevitable pain of expecting things to be way different and better than they're ever going to be here and now. You expect things to be better. And when suffering comes knocking on your door... When pain comes knocking on your door, when hardship comes knocking on your door, you, you find yourself frustrated, like, well, what, this isn't supposed to be happening. Well, one way to guard against those unrealistic expectations is to believe in what the old theologians and philosophers refer to as original sin. The fact that everything around us and everything inside of us is in one way, shape, or form twisted that it's not functioning harmoniously. There is a vandalism of shalom, both externally and internally. And one bit of evidence that we've embraced this bad theology of unrealistic expectations is how angry we get when things don't go our way, 
when hard times walk through the front door. I can't tell you how many people over the years I've talked to, I've, I've counseled, who are shocked that their life is as hard or painful as it is. They expect or expected things should be easier, should be better, and they feel cheated, they feel robbed. They're shocked. I remember being so angry with God when my life fell apart a number of years ago. Angry. I hit rock bottom, and at first I took it because I knew I did some bad stuff and I was paying the price. So I was kind of okay with God in the beginning, but after a while I was furious. Furious. My anger, my fury proved that I felt entitled to something better than I was experiencing, that I had somehow earned credit with God and he was holding out on me. People who had done far worse were suffering way less and I was under the illusion that life was supposed to be better than this because I was better and God owed me better. I had unrealistic expectations or what... Theologians call an overrealized eschatology. How is that? You impressed? You should be. <clears throat> That's a big fancy way of saying that we expect now what God has only promised for later. Uh, overrealized eschatology. Eschatology is the big Bible, I mean, the big theological word that talks about end times and the way things are going to end up in God's favor and ours. But until that time, we're making our way through the wilderness of this life and we're suffering through the ups and downs of this life and the hardships of this life. And an overrealized eschatology is, you may have never heard that phrase before, but at some level you've embraced it if you've ever gotten really angry and felt like you were on the receiving end of injustice because of living life in a broken world. That we expect things to be better now. We expect things, in fact, we believe that God promised that there are plenty of places inside the church, in various churches, where this kind of thing is perpetuated all over the place, that God wants you to be happy and healthy and wealthy now. And the fact that you are not happy and healthy and wealthy proves that you don't really have enough faith or believe God enough. That's an overrealized eschatology. That's bad theology. Because it expects things to be better than God ever said they would be here and now. Um, some people, so I, in, in my case, I wasn't only suffering, I was suffering the way that I was suffering what I was suffering. If that makes sense. I was adding trouble to my trouble by the way I was handling my trouble. But it's not just troubling how we ourselves handle trouble. It's what other people say to us about our pain that often causes more pain also. Um, I mean, the ways in which we are told to cope with pain and loss often make the problem worse. Some people tell us to just quit crying and get down to the business of fixing things and making things right. Come on, stop your whining. Pick yourself up and do the right thing. Things could be a lot worse, you know. Some people uh, glibly tell us that, well, you know, God is in control and we don't need to sweat it. He's working all things out for our good, which is true and also the last thing you want to hear in your crucible of ache. You want to slap those people in the face when they say stuff like that. Uh, At least I do. It's as if they're invalidating your pain and you, they're just sort of expecting you to get over it and, and believe that you, obviously you don't have a tremendous amount of faith in God if you're sweating this so badly. Um, or perhaps we're told that things aren't that bad. At least things could be worse. After all, there are a lot of people out there who have it a lot worse than you. I mean, there are people out there suffering way worse than you. So you lost your job. She just lost her husband. I mean, what gives you the right to grieve over the loss of a job in the face of her losing her husband? We minimize other people's pain by comparing it to someone else's. We do this all the time to each other in a variety of different ways. 
I mean, have you ever felt like you couldn't share the details of a difficult situation without someone immediately offering a solution or some spiritual platitude? Have you ever responded that way yourself? The required cheerfulness that characterizes many of our churches has produced a suffocating environment of pat religious answers to the painful, complex questions that riddle the lives of hurting people. I'm going to say that again. The required cheerfulness that characterizes many of our churches has produced a suffocating environment of pat religious answers to the painful, complex questions that riddle the lives of hurting people. We hurt people who are hurting when we offer pat religious answers, overly simplistic religious pat answers to the complex issues of suffering and hurt and pain. If you have heard or are hearing any of these things, then you know the additional pain it can cause. If you're struggling with guilt, responses like this make you feel more guilt. If you're struggling with regret, responses like this produce more regret. If you're struggling with shame or sadness, those kind of responses cause more of both. It's like telling a drowning person to paddle harder and kick faster. That's like when I read those verses in the Bible, for instance, that say, be anxious for nothing, I get anxious. (laughs) Reading the verse makes me anxious because I'm like, I know I should be anxious for nothing, but I seem to be anxious for everything, and now I'm anxious about the fact that I'm anxious. And I think those verses are there to expose just how badly we need God. For for Paul to say, be anxious for nothing. That is not an attainable goal in this life. (laughs) Okay, it's not. Try it. You tell me. Be anxious for nothing. Now leave here today and for the rest of your days, be anxious for nothing. As if that's going to reduce my level of anxiety. I think the reason Paul gives us verses like that, the reason the Bible gives us verses like that, is to expose the fact that we are anxiety-riddled people, and the answer is not to rid ourselves of our anxiety. The answer is to trust in God. That's it. Um, I uh, once heard, and it may be the best description I've ever heard, of what it feels like for depressed people to try to cheer themselves up. And we get this, you know? I mean, I, I know people who uh, struggle in a, in a serious way with depression, some form of mental illness. And sometimes the people around them just don't understand why they can't snap out of it. You know, I mean, obviously this must be a, a sin problem. You know, maybe there's some secret sin in your life that you haven't confessed and you need to confess it. We're going to learn a lot about Job's friends who said those exact things to him. And uh, I once heard somebody describe um, sort of what it feels like for depressed people to be told to cheer themselves up. Uh, I once heard the person describe it like this. That's like a person with no arms trying to punch themselves until their arms grow back can't do it. It doesn't work. You ever try to snap yourself out of despair? You ever try to cheer yourself out of feeling rejected by someone you love? I mean, suffering is real. It's pain is real. Life is hard. We're plagued by this stuff every day in one way, shape, or form. People disappoint us. We don't get what we want out of a particular situation. Our business business partner's a real pain in the neck. Our, our, Our spouse doesn't understand me. My kids won't call. I wish I had kids and I don't. Why haven't you given me children, God? I mean, there's a lot of this stuff that goes on in the lives of people every day in our life, in your life, in mine. Remember, and we're gonna look at this um, in a few weeks, but Job's friends were great counselors until they opened their mouth. 
We're going to look at this in a couple weeks, but after Job suffers the famous calamities that he suffers, friends from a far off land hear about it and decide to go visit their buddy Job to try and comfort him. And it says that when they saw him from far off, they could barely recognize him because he was so disheveled covered from head to toe in sores, hair ripped out of his head, completely disheveled, unlike anything of the sophisticated version of Job that they had known. And when they got there, Job was just sitting on the ground in in sackcloth and ashes, weeping. And his friends didn't know what to say, and so they just sat there with him for a week, tore their own clothes and wept with him. They wept with the one who was weeping. And then after a week, they opened their mouth. And what they said caused much more trouble for Job than just his troubles. His friends were great counselors until they opened their mouth. Listen, one of the best things you can do, one of the best things you can do, in in fact, probably the best thing you can do, when you're dealing with someone who is struggling, who is suffering, who is hurting, do not try to solve their problem. And don't try to fix them. Don't try to give them some advice. Just weep with those who weep. Say, I, I can't imagine. I just, I can't imagine. I'm here for anything and everything you need. I haven't been through what you've been through, so I just can't, I can't imagine. I can't even pretend to understand it. The moment you try to pretend to understand it, you lose them. Job's friends were great counselors until they opened their mouths. Well, it's totally natural, I think, to ask why when we're suffering. You know, I think we all do. It's pretty natural. Why me? Why now? Why him? Why her? Why this? Why God? Why? I think that's totally natural, but what I've discovered is that focusing on why assumes that information has the power to heal. That if I just knew why this was happening, if I could just access that data, then the pain would be easier to endure. But we know by experience that information and explanations do not have that power. They don't have the power to mend a broken heart. They don't have the power to heal. We see this, and we will see this in the story of Job. Even if God had told Job why he was suffering, even if he had explained it to Job, Job would have still had to deal with the loss of his health and his family and his wealth. See, the truth is, we may never fully understand why God allows us to suffer in the ways that we do. Never. But we don't need answers as much as we need God with us when we're suffering. You see, when it comes to suffering, if we do not go to our graves in confusion, we do not go to our graves trusting. Explanations are so often a substitute for trust. I remember years ago, I think I may have told you this story before, years ago, uh, a a well-known counselor and and friend of our family by the name of Larry Crabb wrote a number of books. Some of you may have heard of him. Uh, He died about a year ago or so. Just a remarkable man, a psychologist by trade, a remarkable man. Um, In fact, the whole reason that my family and I live in South Florida, that I grew up in South Florida, that my mom and dad moved our family to South Florida uh, in the late 70s was so that my dad and Larry Crabb could go into private practice together because my dad was a psychologist also, and Larry recruited him to South Florida. And uh, I remember when I was in graduate school, I was listening to tapes, for those of you who don't know what those things are. Those were little contraptions that you would stick in the dashboard of your car. Never, never mind. Um, and uh, and there w- it was a tape of him talking about suffering. And he uh, had a brother that he was very close to. Bill was his name, I think, who was a professor at the college that I graduated from. And Bill, years earlier, had died in a plane wreck. And 
Bill and Larry were very close. Bill was Larry's best friend and vice versa. And Bill's death crushed Larry, crushed him. He couldn't seem to get over it. Regardless of how much time had passed, he couldn't seem to get over it. And whenever he would go speak in public and tell the story of Bill's death and his struggle with Bill's death, he said invariably people would come up to him and say, it's going to be okay, Larry. God works all things out for good. God's in control. There will probably be many more people in heaven because of the fact that Bill died and his testimony is so great. And Larry said, you know, at first I tried to digest that stuff. And I tried to see beyond the words to the intention of the person sharing those things with me. He said, and after a while, I just started getting angry, mad. I don't care if more people are going to be in heaven, he thought. My brother's dead, and I miss him. Why, God? And he never really came up with an answer. That was his answer, that he didn't have an answer. And it was him who said, if we do not go to our graves in confusion, we will not go to our graves trusting explanations are a substitute for trust. I was driving in my car when I heard that line, and I pulled over on the side of the road so that I could write that down. And it has stuck with me ever since, 20 some odd years. You see, it's not relief that we ultimately need, it's God. It's not answers that we ultimately need. It's God. It's not a problem-free life that we ultimately need. It's God. It's not the best marriage possible that we need. It's God. It's not our kids are doing well and thriving. That's what I need more than anything in this world. It's not. It's God. That's what we need. In fact, What we're going to see over the course of these next handful of weeks is that suffering and pain and failure are the things God uses to produce most good in us and for us. It was Fyodor Dostoevsky, the Russian novelist, who said, pain and suffering are always inevitable for a large intelligence and a deep heart. How true is that? The best stuff Humility, trust, faith, some of the best things that could ever be produced inside of us are produced in the crucible of ache, in the face of trouble and suffering and hardship and pain. What we need, in other words, most is the presence of God, not the absence of suffering. We need the presence of God more than we need the absence of suffering. So I'll just say this, that the bad news is that our brokenness isn't going away just yet. It will one day, but not yet. That's the bad news. But the good news is God isn't going away either. That he walks with us in and through all of our valleys of the shadow of death. All of them. God is interested in you. The you who suffers. The you who inflicts suffering on others. We are both victims and victimizers, every one of us. God is interested in you, the you who hides, the you who has bad days, the the you who wants to quit, the you who is tired of being afraid, tired of being alone. You, he's interested in you and he meets you right where you are. And while he never promised that he would rescue us from our pain in this life, he did promise to be with us in it. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The cross is the best place to see this. The cross is the best place to see God curled up on the bathroom floor with us. Nobody put it better than Robert Capon, in my opinion, when he said that on the cross, God came to us 
in the brokenness of our health, in the shipwreck of our lives, in the loss of all peace of mind, in the very thick of our sins. He saves us in our disasters, not from them. Christ on the cross meets us in our suffering and conflicts, not in the promise to take them away here and now. He is simply with us in all of our times. While we may be always dealing with the seemingly omnipresence of suffering, we also live under the umbrella of God's omnipresence. He's with us always. Even to the end of the age, Jesus said. He's with us. He's never not with you. He's never standing at some antiseptic distance from your trouble because he doesn't want to get his hands dirty. The cross is the best place to see God with his hands in the dirt. Curled up on the bathroom floor with you. Jesus, and, just, and I know this, the temptation is to think, yeah, Jesus, does Jesus really know what I'm going through? He wasn't married, so how does he know what it's like to deal with a wife, okay? I mean, he didn't have kids. How does he know what, how, how does he know what it feels like to deal with kids who won't listen? I mean, he, he didn't have a, a business partner. He didn't have a mother-in-law. I mean, my gosh, really? He understands me? okay. But when you think about it, he's been through it all. He knows exactly what it feels like to be misunderstood. He knows exactly what it feels like to be alone, to be abandoned by friends and family. He knows. He knows what it feels like to be sad. He knows what it feels like to be unloved. He knows what it feels like to be betrayed, to be stabbed in the back by people he trusted. He knows what it feels like to be unjustly accused. He knows what it feels like to long for different circumstances. He's been where you are. And he promises to stay with you in it. That Jesus, who knows you, who loves you, who's been where you are, promises to be with you always always to never blink, to never bail. So suffering is real and we're not super spiritual by pretending that it's not. Life sucks. Thank God there is beauty amongst the ashes. Good music, for instance. A date night with my wife. Good food. A great movie good conversations with friends, vacations, money in the bank to pay the bills. I mean, thank God that he is always our protector and our provider in the wilderness. But life is more hard than it is easy, and I think all of us would agree to that. It just is. I was driving here this morning, and I'm thinking, I feel great today. I had a wonderful day of sermon prep yesterday. I'm working on a book right now, and I'm loving the way it's going. It's a beautiful day outside. I live in Jupiter. I'm so happy. I'm like, this is going to come crashing down by the end of the day. I guarantee it. <laughs> it's just too good to be true right now. Something's going to happen. I don't know what it is. Um, but I've sort of come to expect the fact that life is more hard than easy. It's more sad than happy. It's hard. And as hard as it is, and as painful as it is, God promises to be with us. I will walk with you through the wilderness of this life, and I promise I will get you to the other side. There is a promised land waiting for you. And I will get you there. I will carry you there, but not yet. Let's pray together.